in case we have to cut some of the beginning out because the audio was <laughs> messed up when we went straight to Bill. Uh, James Dinsmore is a high school journalism teacher at Elite Scholars Academy, which is a magnet school in Jonesboro. And again, Bill Doris is a uh, former all kinds of things in local news, photojournalist, news director. Uh, I'm a former TV news reporter. And uh, the other question, well, actually, first, James, I want to give you a chance to answer that. When, when you know, you're not talking technical skills, what do you talk to your students about? And I know they're young, but as far as approaching an issue, for instance, a complex issue, and how to weed through the, you know, the the spin and fact from fiction and, uh, you know, all that stuff. What do you guys talk about from, a you know, that sort of theoretical perspective? Um, you know, that's that's actually a uh, a difficult thing for kids to to kind of grasp because they're so inundated, um, whether it's it's online on social media or what they see on YouTube, or um, what they see on on, on the news, um, they're so in, in, inundated uh, on a particular slant, a particular way. You know, I'm I'm constantly having when they come up with an idea, they have to we we I give them the opportunity to to come up with an idea for a story. They have to pitch it, pitch the story idea um, to me and to to the director, um, and then they have to go out and obviously do the research and, and put the package together. Um, but they, they don't understand that it's slanted this particular way because they're just so inundated. I have to ask them, well, have you thought about, you know, this, what about this? Why are they doing that? And it, and it kind of makes them start to think a little bit, you know, um, I, I, I try to, um, place on them that it's really important to be a problem solver, you know, to be a critical thinker. Um, because if you just go with what somebody else tells you without investigating, then you're doing a disservice not only to the people that you're producing the show for, but you're doing a, a disservice to yourself. So um, the, uh, I, I hit critical thinking, problem solving, regardless of what they do and everything that, that we do. You know, instead of cry help, how can I fix something? Why is it like this? They have to figure out those questions. So um, do me a favor, James. Can you scoot over yourself, your camera, just a little bit to your right so you're back in the center? That's better. That's better. Okay. Yeah, just when we're in the three shot, then then we can, well, a little bit more. A little bit more. We want to see your whole face. Not There you go. <laughs> Much better. Okay. So somebody had a question. Before I get back to the super chats about the popular stories and legacy media and whatnot, um... Somebody had a good question because you said something about uh, why is this, and I don't, maybe you, you meant it differently, but when you said originally telling the stories that people like, in, in a way that people like to hear or something like that. Let me go back to the question so I can see if I can find the exact wording. Um, well, I can't, but basically, because I, I heard you say, um, teaching the students how to tell a story in the way that people can understand and like to hear. What do you mean by like to hear? Because there's a lot of, of concern, say, like right now in, in today's journalism world that we're only getting stuff we want to hear versus stuff that is, you know, not slanted to one particular direction or another. Right, right. I, I'm, um, first of all, telling it so that they can understand. You have to tell it in a, in a way that, that, that it can be understood. Um and a lot of times that that's um, not I don't want to say dummying down, but, you know, you have you have to take sometimes complex issues and you have to try to explain that in a simple way so that it's easily understood by everybody um, and not trying to leave anyone else out. But I'm I'm of the um, mindset that we all want to hear the truth and that we all want to. Um, here, get the news that's not slanted one way or the other, that gives us facts and it lets us decide for ourselves one way or the other, instead of it it being, you know, slanted or something. So that's what I mean by um, want to hear the news that I like, that I, I don't, I don't, on either side, I don't want to hear one way or the other. Just tell me what the facts are, why the, the story is important, and then let me try to figure out, you know, 
whether I want to continue watching or I want to change it and go to another channel or something. Allison, can I jump in on that? Yeah, just and a then little bit? when you finish, can you also answer the question why do stories really popular with audiences like medicine problem exposes not get a lot of TV and print space and legacy media? Can you also answer that? Uh, well, go go ahead, Mr. Dinsmore. I'll let you. No, no, that. go ahead and say your go go ahead and say what you were going to say, and then and then we'll go to that. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, well, what I was going to kind of add is what Mr. Dinsmore is teaching is just straight up journalism 101, present the facts. Don't. But the issue that I think we're running into a lot these days with somebody who's working with young journalists straight out of high school, straight out of college, let me rephrase that, used to work with young journalists fresh out of high school and fresh out of college, is a lot of times you see a lot of people with influence and or somewhat of importance try to push them to tell the story a certain way. Allison and I have had a conversation before where I mentioned I used to work for a news director who, uh, during the subprime mortgage crisis, all he wanted when you talked about that story was hammer home how the financial companies are bad, hammer home how these people are getting robbed. And to me, I think that every particular person in that situation may have a different story. Like this is somebody who, you know, just didn't read what they signed. And so, Mr. Densmore, how do you combat that a little bit? Um. Maybe with a big hammer. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, you know, I was just sitting here thinking, um, it's when you when you're getting paid by someone, you know, when you're having to to pay for your car and pay for your house and, and the electric bill, and the uh, determining factor on you making that money to pay those bills, is somebody that's wanting you to, to, to be a particular way, you know, whereas me as a high school teacher, I don't have to face that. I don't have to, um, or my kids don't have to face that. The only thing they have to worry about is their grade. And a lot of times they don't really worry about that. So um, when they get to college, you know, I think that, and I, I don't know personally, but I believe that journalism kind of expands into other things like it's a business. I mean, you have to start treating it like a business when you when you get there. And once you get into um, an actual, you know, station, wherever that is, then, you know, it, again, it's, it's about getting paid. So. <clears throat> OK, so back to this question, why do stories really popular with audiences like medicine problem exposes not get a lot of TV and print space and legacy media? Um, well, I don't think it's necessarily from, this is my perspective on it. Um, I'm going to go for that. I'm going to interpret this question and I don't know if I'm going to get that right, but why do exposés, let's just take out medicine problems, just exposés, investigative journalism, not get a lot of TV and print space and legacy media. One of the really big problems is just the shrinking amount of investigative journalists and investigative teams, especially in television news. Um, I worked with a couple really good ones, but my station was one of the few that had a couple people still doing investigative journalism. Investigative journalism takes a lot of time. It's sometimes they will work five or six months on a story and maybe not even end up having anything to show for it. That means you're paying somebody a salary that's not producing like the rest of your team, which has to produce sometimes two to three stories a day and doing it with, you know, no, no uh, teammate, basically. Like I've talked about before how I used to shoot, edit, write, go on camera, drive the car. I did it all by myself. It was virtually impossible for somebody like me, unless my bosses would every once in a while, like they did once and, you know, once or twice, um, I got to really spend a significant amount of time on a story where they'd take me off for like a month. Um, but that was very rare because the dollar is the bottom line, unfortunately. Even the managers, I think, who are really still want to do good journalism, they understand that, you know, their job is under a microscope. If they don't deliver ratings, if people are not putting new content out for all the live shows that we have going on. And then on top of it, I think there's also maybe, I can't say what this was like 15 
you know, 20 years ago, well, maybe 15 years ago, I could say, but not, not really much older than that pre 2008 recession. Cause that's when I started in the business, but I don't know what it was like from the personal curiosity standpoint of journalists, um, you know, in TV news specifically, I think there is a problem with, with journalists both not having enough time and resources to be curious, but also, you know, coming often towards these stories and issues with very similar perspectives because they have similar backgrounds, similar education, similar cultural backgrounds. Uh, they think similarly about topics. They often vote similarly. And so I don't know if they're necessarily just as, as curious anymore to, to, to fish out, um, the, you know, the, the stories that require someone to, you know, to push past, I guess, just what you accept to be reality in, in an everyday world. So you, you both need a natural sense of wanting to dig to the truth, you know, at the bottom of whatever, you know, big dumpster you, you've been handed with all this kinds of information and figure out what's there and what's worthy of, of paying attention to that. That's something you can't really teach someone, but then on top of it, you also have to be equipped with the time and the resources to chase after that. And those two things I think are, are hurting right now. What, what would you say about that bill? I would say that on the more local levels, exposés, and I don't like that word, but uh, cause I, I see expose as media, not mm. journalism, but I really think uh, that type of reporting is mainly saved for sweeps pieces, if you will, at which least it, on the uh, local. Which there, which it is right now. I should say, I had somebody, one of my former mm -hmm. colleagues, send me her latest. Uh, it's February sweeps. We're in the heart of it right now. So if you're seeing mm -hmm. your local news station go tonight, you know, special report <laughs> about blah blah. Tonight, our <laughs> yeah, expose. tonight our expose <laughs> on whatever. That's because it's February sweeps, and they're getting the ratings this month. So they're really trying to get you to watch. Now, if you look at mainstream media, if you look at the big three, if you look at ABC, CBS, NBC, on their 6.30 news, well, 6.30 on the East Coast, you know, wherever you're at, their evening news rarely, very rarely has those types of uh, pieces anymore. They really don't have those type of investigative journalism because it's boom, 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 boom. It's... Um, you know, quantity over quality. They save that stuff for shows like 2020, 60 Minutes, and stuff like that to get you to watch those programs. And then you've got major cable news networks like, say, Fox News or uh, CNN. They can do those as well. But even then, they're getting more few and far between. And I think it's because for it to be quality and all the fact-checking that you have to do, it takes time and it takes money. If I have a reporter who everybody loves. I can't have him working, you know, 16 hours a day on this one piece. I need him out in the field covering this. I need him out in the field covering that. So that's a big part of the reason why there's some other, what I'd like to call rabbit hole reasons, but we're not going to get into that. We're trying to stick to the facts yeah. here, folks. Um, mm -hmm. Philip fan. Thanks for the super yeah. chat. And then this is another good question. Lucas Gonzalez. I don't know if this has been talked about. My journalism college professor went into depth about how being objective is a bad hegemonic theory that needs to be stopped because it hinders social progression. Um, and I think that's a really, the, the debate over whether, um, uh, and also actually to clarify, Bob, Wildfish said, I met exposés already made that are popular with audiences that could be shown again at any time, but aren't. So clarification there. So I don't know if anybody has any thoughts, but real fast to go to um, that objectivity um, question, because I do think there's probably a fair conversation to have about when you're talking about the difference between someone who is genuinely trying to get to the bottom of things, but is, is a human and thereby cannot just live in a vacuum, right? We're all going to be reporting from some kind of perspective. We all have a, of some kind of, of upbringing and experiences that affect the way we see things. There's a difference, I think, between that and like overtly trying to, um, to court a particular audience where you're knowingly being deceptive. I think, I think those two, I, I, I guess I differentiate those. I'm not sure what you guys think about that. I was just reading something in the Columbia journalism review about, distrust in, uh, and I'm going to, I'll bring it up here so that people can see it. But, um, this is the fall rise and fall of media trust. 
And they talk a lot about how it was during the Nixon administration that the press went from being called the press to the media because they were so adversarial, the Nixon administration and the press. Um, and it was specifically to kind of, you know, put them in a light of, of uh, skepticism, that the public should be skeptical of them. And then that we've just been kind of using that term ever since. But there is a little bit of discussion here about about that idea. Um, and and this is this is the quote. It may be time for journalists to acknowledge that they write from a set of values, not simply from a disinterested effort at truth. This will not be easy. So what do you guys think about that? Uh, Allison, I would say this. You had a guest on your show one time, and I was watching the live stream, a gentleman who used the term <laughs> negative truthful information. And I wanted to put my effing head. <laughs> I don't a remember brick that. Wall. That's what I was. I, that that was. I can't. He was a lawyer oh, okay. or something. <laughs> it sounds like a yeah, lawyer. He he used the term. Yeah, he said negative truthful information. I'm sorry. Information, it, or facts are not objective. Okay, two plus two is four. Okay, math and facts. You know, things like this, they're not objective. Now you can question the facts and say, oh, you know, I don't trust what you're saying. Let me see if two plus two equals four. And that's fine. But the facts are the facts. They're not objective. They're indisputable. So, and that's what journalism is supposed to be. Mr. Dinsmore, I digress to you, sir. <laughs> I agree 100%. Yes, sir. I, I'm, um, I wrote down here as as uh, Allison was talking that uh, when I went to school and I, I have a degree in, in um, English um, and wanted to be an English teacher actually uh, at one time, but you know um, persuasive writing was something I I really uh, excelled in, and I think that a lot of um, journalists that are coming up now, a lot of uh, my kids uh, are being pushed in that direction as opposed to being more uh, objective. I also, um, something hit me, you know, it used to be local news was, was news about stuff was happening um, here. You know, it was personal stories and stuff. Now local news really is a lot more national news. I mean, my kids, you know, because um, I, I asked them to watch the news and tell me what they think about it. And a lot of times I'm getting, you know, the stuff that's happening nationally that's affecting everybody is, is what's on all the news. It's regardless of what you watch. That's, that's what it is. That's why I said a while ago, they, they're just inundated and, in, and in all these uh, things. I think, yeah, yeah go ahead. I, I would have to agree with that. Well, and I, and I kind of wonder if that's changed and, you know, under the Trump administration, there's just more of that, or if it's attrition of just people that can do local journalism. So they're just no. filling it with, you know, with uh, the wires. I don't know. What do you think? Allison, I, I don't mean to sound contrary or disagree with you, but you I thought in well, <laughs> uh, I honestly believe that this started long before anything related to politics. And I'm going to give you my example. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, this is my truth. <laughs> but either way, uh, the the Columbine mm -hmm. shooting, when that happened, I was working at a local television station. And of course, like back in the day, most of the time, if something big national broke, you found some way to tie it into your community. Did you have a survivor's relative or, you know, did somebody go to school here that now teaches at Columbine, you know, just mm -hmm. for an example. But the biggest way, the first way that this, and this is the same news director about the subprime mm -hmm. mortgage crisis, by the way. Uh, okay. So we need to find out how to tie this locally. And his way to tie it locally was Kentucky has the worst gun laws in the nation. And a bunch of us in the newsroom who, you know, Kentucky born and bred are, Okay, according to who? Because according to the NRA, Kentucky has the best laws in the union. According to the ACLU, they have the worst. So what is that truth? And that was long before, mm -hmm. that was back when Trump wasn't a racist, If to make kind of a bad joke there. But I, I mean, that's, but that's how far back that Well, goes. actually, to uh, go back to that um, article that I was referencing, try to find the place where they're talking about it, but because this does sort of 
um, this does sort of go back all the way even to George Washington. Um, it says even George Washington, including and Thomas Jefferson, judged newspapers to be full of lies. Editors didn't have much regard for their own kind, sometimes challenging one another to duels. And there is a history of popular violence against the media. <laughs> and so it, you know, it's like said notably against abolitionist newspapers, for the civil war, and against black journalists, institution at various points thereafter, a matter not of distrust, but of hate and fear. Um, polling allowed us to measure public confidence in the press and compare it to that in other institutions. Over the decades for which such data has been available, we've seen that people tend to think of journalism in a more favorable light than, say, the White House or Congress but as less trustworthy than medicine, education, the military, organized religion, or major corporations. Now, I did a video for my channel about a year ago talking about how it was actually very similar distrust of government and distrust of, of mainstream journalism. So we're, we're kind of riding the same line. Um, but that that in that Nixon era and post-Nixon era, he this, this author, um, Michael Schudson, I think, this, this is from 2019, says that that's kind of when it really started to ramp up this we're going to hold the government accountable versus what what probably was a bad thing which was we were in some cases a mouthpiece well it's still i think someone people could actually still make an argument that we still have that issue obviously of uh you know outlets being a mouthpiece for the government um but but it but it was maybe more accepted to just uh, it, in other words maybe you didn't have to hide it as much all right you didn't have to hide the propaganda as much as you feel like nowadays maybe news stations have to try to pretend like they're not pushing propaganda um but uh, but that this idea of advocacy and um, and uh, you know s just sticking it to the the man like that kind of idea that the that which is of course ex just accelerated in Twitter you know at Twitter I feel like has has made a lot of questions for for press conferences uh, if, you know I don't just if you can't if it's not gonna go well on Twitter I'm not gonna ask it you know things like so I think that's just accelerated the process of this idea that I, I'm here as morality crusader and I need to the, the problem is because because this author argues that this is a good thing that we should just own that we we are gonna hold the powerful accountable we should just own it that that's what we do I don't think the public has a problem with the idea of holding the powerful accountable. I think the the problem is the public sees that we only hold certain powerful people accountable or certain powerful institutions accountable or certain powerful talking points accountable. And that's the issue. So when journalists are talking like this in this article, that's where I see their argument break down because I think I can go with these people as far as, yeah, I, I see the importance of journalists to, to be uh, open and aware and, and, and brave enough to speak out against power structures that I wouldn't disagree with that and just own that, that that's, that's what we're due. It, the problem is that like which power structure and if we failed at, at holding all structures accountable that come across our, our um, desks, or is it just the ones that don't reaffirm our confirmation bias? That That's just my thoughts. Uh. Mr. Densmore, one mm -hmm. of the things that I've always taught either interns or first time journalists, young journalists, some of the, one of the things I taught them, I taught them my golden rule of news reporting. And what that is, it's a three it's a three pronged attack. Protect yourself, protect your gear and then protect the story. The reasoning behind that is there's only one of you. So you got to protect yourself. Uh, journalism was my passion, not so much anymore, but at the time. You know, but there's still it's still just a job, and there's only one of you. The mm -hmm. gear is expensive, so try to protect it if you can, and mm -hmm. then protect the story. So that was what I used to teach to uh, younger journalists. Uh, what would what's the biggest piece of advice you give to your guys and girls? Wow. <clears throat> um, that there's there is no excuse. For, for not having character. Character is the one thing that um, you as an individual can can protect. Uh, and it's the most important thing uh, to me. So I teach the, the kids, you know, regardless of what else happens, um, if you have character, if you, if you, um, or stand behind what you say, you know, 
do do the research, um, figure out the the answers, and and then go with it, but know that you did what you feel was right. As long as you can say, I'm I'm I know that this is according to my research and according to uh, everything I found out, this is what, what, the, what is the, the truth. This is what's happened. Um, and then you can't, no one can, can question you as long as the truth, you know, uh, you can't, you can't play a video and edit something that happened a year ago and put it in saying that it happened two days ago. You can't do that. You know, my kids would, 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 get spanked really hard if, if uh, they were to do something like that. But, you know, yeah, try that just, today. <laughs> exactly. Um, that's just kind of the, the again, it's it's about life, um, Bill. It, it's about, um, you know, my my subject area um, is important. And we do a lot of things besides journalism. We do, you know, film, too. I have kids that, that make short films and and. Uh, here in Georgia, where, where I have kids that are working, you know, in the film industry, um, but it's about life. It's 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 what do you what? How can you take care of yourself? How can you take care of others? You know, putting yourself, um, and that's that's really been a hard thing for me to get across to kids now. Um, is you know, put others in front of you. Don't you you have to think about what others. Uh, think and do instead of automatically reacting to something is is to sit back and, and say well okay you know how or why did that person do this or did it say that you know instead of automatically reacting which is like what all of our kids it seems like it's it, it's mm -hmm. doing now you know they're automatically they're so reactive about yeah. anything without without investigating or without you know, trying to find out mm -hmm. the truth. That It's funny truth. that you say that because whenever I'm asked to speak on panels about journalism and they say, what's your one thing that you would do to fix it? <laughs> Which is like, uh, it's a big question, but I, I, I always say it, it's a, it is a, a, a change in the journalist own individual posture towards the world around her, frankly, that there's, it, it really, a, a lot of people would say it, the, the ratings or the money or all these things. But my argument is that you could have somebody that is a millionaire, um, doing journalism, doesn't need any money and doesn't need anybody to watch. And they could still totally mess it up because they're, like you said, they have an emotional attachment to the world around them in, in a way that is so strong that, that it's very hard for them to see other points of view or to be curious about other points of view and to be not just curious, but to like that, you know, to, to actually enjoy that process of learning new things and not just trying to argue against someone. It's a very different way of seeing the truth gathering process, I guess. The way I, I see it is that it's fun and interesting to be in a place where your ideas about what you thought were true are challenged. I like those moments where I'm like, I, I never knew that. Wow. That's fascinating. Instead of, Oh God, I got to figure out how to argue back against that because it, it challenges the way that my parents taught me when I was growing up. My teachers taught me when I was in school, my buddies think when we go out to the bar. Um, and so, so really there's to me, there's very little change without the journalists themselves doing some self-reflection on a regular. That's why we say like spend 10 minutes a day in silence, just spend 10 minutes a day in silence. See if you can do it, you know, sit in silence and just like take a few deep breaths and disengage from Twitter and disengage from the platforms and, and try to just calm yourself down enough that you can see the world around you a little bit more logically and a little bit more clearly and not just be defensive or angry or scared um, and just emotionally attached to things having to be a certain way. Because if you are that, 
it doesn't matter how much money in the world is, is thrown at you or, or what strings you don't have attached. It's still, you, you can't force somebody to see something that they can't see. I guess that's, that's sort of the way I look at it. What one quick question from Bob, um, would you support the return to duels for journalists and politicians? I think we should put it to a vote. I'm just going to go ahead and say, can we do it retroactively? Because there's some people I would love to go back and duel. <laughs> yeah. I think people are already dueling, but they just do it on social media. I just think they just don't physically duel anymore. Oh, no. I thought we were talking about drawing pistols, take 10 Yeah, that is what he's talking the, about. The yeah, I think that is what he's talking oh, about. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm, well, we'll definitely I'm make sure we have I, it in Kentucky it, since you have the worst gun laws, as you as you said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I... I, I Obviously, as a civilized human being, and I mean, I, and this is a joke, and that's great, but you know, j just kind of a fun fact before Mr. Dinsmore jumps in there, I would rather go back and duels more people that I've worked with in sports media than news journalism, if that helps you out any. Mr. Dinsmore, uh, the youth, sir. Yes, sir. Um, you know, I, I, one of the other things, and I, I should have uh, mentioned this earlier, but you know, um, and it's, it goes back to being people um, skills is I, I, I would would <laughs> get really, <laughs> really upset with one of my kids if they acted some of the way that, that you know, like like the Washington Press Corps um, acted. I mean, you, you have to treat each other with respect. You have to, to when you're trying to find out about a story. And I know that, that, you know, you're trying to get to the bottom of something, but there's still a level of respect that just went out the window. It, 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 there are people just treating, I, I, I mean, my kids see it and they come you know, talk to me and I, I have to say, you know, they have a choice to be that way. You have a choice to be the way that you are. So, you know, I, I would be just really, really upset uh, with anyone who treated someone else or mistreated them, you know, with, with disrespect like that um, in, because all, in all circumstances. To, to kind of backtrack on what he's saying there, I don't know if anybody has ever watched the TV show The West Wing. There's a great scene. It's a classic, iconic scene where uh, the president is leaving and he tells this one lady, uh, you know, by the way, in this building, we still stand when the president leaves the room. And the lady is embarrassed and she stands up very sheepishly. Imagine now if a president, well, I don't care which president you're talking about, Trump, Biden, doesn't matter. If a president stopped and said that now, uh, Jim Acosta with Trump would have done this. And that's just the blatant disrespect. And mm -hmm. that kind of exemplifies where we're at right now. And it's kind of terrible. Uh, well, I do yeah. think that the, the journalists getting followings by being, by being theatrical, I guess, about, <laughs> about their posture towards, because again, I don't think any of us have a problem with, with the accountability side of things, like actually asking questions that are important for people to hear and holding, holding folks in, like the president or any other person in power uh, accountable to whatever it is and wanting to actually get to the bottom of things. Um, it's the theatrics, I think, of it and and then the book deals that follow and the Twitter th threads that follow and, the you know, how everything now is the likes, the comments, the retweets, how, every, how everything is... Um, is oh gosh, what's the right word that I'm looking for? Your your journalism is it's not monetized, but the you know it's the num it's 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 uh, deemed a success based on a different model, I guess, than perhaps before you had the opportunity to become your own star, you know, your own star in the, in this, in outside of your newsroom, you have these ways of directly communicating with the public. Now you don't have to go through your outlet so you can become a little star. And, and, and the way that people are becoming stars in today's world is through that kind of theatrical journalism. And, and so when, when you're approaching it that way, then also it, I think affects the way one sees who you should be asking those questions to, because when you start building an audience that wants you to sock it to one person, but they would be very upset if you socked it to the other. Now it's not just, now you've created this, right? You've created this, this monster by going after this person that you now have grown a brand around. And if you were to all of a sudden do that to the people that these folks following you, uh, 
do like, you lose your stardom. And I don't know if that's that's a phenomenon that was really around, you know, 20 or 30 years ago because you didn't have the ability to go straight to the public. There wasn't this direct-to-consumer model necessarily in the same way that there is now. Um, now, that's opened up opportunities like for us to do what we're doing right now. But it also, I think, has taken your average journalist and given them the opportunity, again, to become a mini celebrity in a way that they never were before. And so, there, so there's that theatric to it. Um, Philip says... Journalism is a, is not a science. Wouldn't it make sense that the reader viewer take responsibility for what they consume? Seems like the public has abdicated <laughs> responsibility for thinking. And I do think that's a really fair point. At the end of the day, we do all have to take responsibility, but just curious what you guys think about that. Oh, you heard me laugh. <laughs> I mean, this is this is an argument we've been having for since the invention of the television. Uh, if you don't like it, don't watch it or monitor what your kids watch. You know, that's not a new argument and it's definitely not new to television news. So me, me personally, I'm a huge advocate of personal responsibility and responsibility of your family. So I understand and appreciate the sentiment of what the uh, super chat says, but we're way beyond that. So what do you think, uh, James? Yeah. Uh, I would agree with Bill 100%. Yes, sir. Um, it's, uh, it's more what uh, I when I watch the news, and I and I honestly don't do a lot of it um, because of you know I, I try to get my my news in other other ways. Meaning you um, don't watch a lot of TV news, is that what you're saying? Okay. Right. Yeah. Even yeah, though you teach it, it's funny of, that you uh, say that because I used to say I just make it. I don't watch it. <laughs> yeah. Well. Yeah. <laughs> it's um, true. And that kind of goes uh, with my point there. Um, you know, it's about what it's about what's happening. It's not about who's happening uh, or who's saying it. Um, so that's that would be that. My, it kind of uh, yeah brings me thing. to this next comment. Ron Peterson, don't become a part of the story is what I heard a lot in the newsroom, even when I was mostly a video editor. That seems to have changed. Mm -hmm. exactly. Well, that that has changed with the advent of social media. The uh, the Jim Acostas of the world, the Dom Lemons of the world, they care more about their own personal brand versus journalism and the story or even storytelling for that matter. There is a fantastic journalist named Forrest Sanders that works for WSMV in Nashville. That guy is the best storyteller, editor, photographer, combo platter, you know, the best one man band I've ever seen. He could be the story of everything that he does, but he never makes it about himself. And he's always trying to tell the best story that he possibly can. He's a good journalist. Don't get me wrong. He can report slime, grime, and crime. But when it comes to storytelling, nobody does it better. And it's never about him. There's never a personal stand up. There's never a mention uh, reference to himself. That would be the ideal way you'd want to tell stories, whether it's hardcore news or a feel good story. Scott says, if you are in a small market, good luck shopping anywhere else than Walmart. The news is no different. <laughs> he, he's not wrong. <laughs> He, he's uh, I know Allison I know you hate that saying no I, I actually used it but... in my la one of my last videos so I can't I can't be uh, hypocritical <laughs> anymore and I, I uh, um, just to kind of piggyback on what uh, Bill was saying there um, the the dollar I mean you know those like Acosta and, and Lemon um, yeah I don't I don't really care for the way that they they do things the managers, the people who paid their salary, um, would say something, would do something, then and they wouldn't act that way. <laughs> I mean, that's the bar. Where, where do we do we uh, make the comment or, or or go to to say this needs to change? You know, it, not necessarily on a journalism or journalist level but i i mean it's it's above that because those people in my humble opinion um and maybe they're jerks and, and act that way all the time but um I, I believe i've seen jim acosta act pretty nice sometimes the one, once or twice so if he 
was said, you know, this is how things should be, then I think um, if management, you know, his boss or whoever signs his paycheck would say that. Yeah, I think so. you're right that it's the the managers allow it. So and maybe encourage it. So if if there was a different model at the top, then I, I do think obviously they they have the capacity to be that way, but they're encouraged. I think you're right. And then also we are kind of in this era again of of stardom around controversy and adversarial um, mm -hmm. theatrics. And so so that somehow has gotten this again, once again, like setting myself up as morality crusader and bearer of the truth, which I'm not I don't know if that that may have been the way journalists thought of themselves 100 years ago. I don't know. It just, I think maybe in today's world, um, the addition of all kinds of information now that we, that the corporate model doesn't have control over the corporate news, you know, the legacy news doesn't have control over. I think that's added to the sense that we really have to get on top of it now. Right. Cause now people really have access to other information. It's not just us anymore. They're listening to. So now it's really dangerous out there. So I think that's amped up this sense of, of needing to stand in between the public and harmful information and, and translate for them. Um, Courtney Gray says, I love the West wing. Have you watched the newsroom? Yes. I love that show. Have you guys seen that show? I, I really, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was, uh, I, I thought it was very well put together. Oh, I actually maybe thinking about it. breaking news, the funny what? show that Tina Fey wrote. I think that's what I was, I was thinking about. I, okay. I, newsroom. Yeah. Newsroom is the one with the blonde haired guy. From okay. Tony haven't Dummer. seen that one. What is his name? <laughs> Yeah, I, I can't remember, but he's got the awesome bio of uh, why America isn't the greatest country in the world anymore. But it, it's still a really, really good show. I enjoyed it. But the most accurate portrayal of news. I'm going to do a breakdown for the channel someday. It would be a really fun <laughs> live stream, too, I think. We should. I'm Alice Morrow, yeah, and this exactly. is the breakdown. <laughs> We should have a a, a a watch party. You know, I could get my that students. That would be awesome. And, you know, oh, God. that would be hilarious. Together. That would be really cool. Um, that would be awesome. I love that. Okay, idea. Bob Wildfish, is there any hope to rebalance journalist students to be more politically and culturally representative of the country? I hate to sound like a. I mean, you can always. I mean, seriously, you can always have hope, and I think with uh, teachers like. Mr. Dinsmore and many others that I've encountered through my travels, I think that I, there's always hope, but right now that balance, it's just not popular. It's not what sell. You know what I say when controversy creates cash and that's what the corporations want. That's what they want, want to sell, not the truth, the truth, but there is hope. Yeah, I'm I'm uh I'm all optimist at heart. Um, that's just the way I'm wired. Um, but it's getting harder. Uh, it certainly was a lot easier back when I first started teaching. And, and uh, if I had to ask a student, you know, do I need to call mom or dad? They would, yeah, no sir, I'm good right here. Now if I say, <laughs> do I need to call mom or dad? Oh, uh, it's. Right you know and, and do that so it's like you're you know what the next comment is that i'm bringing up because this is from john lewis crying journalists are the worst these days you see you didn't even know that it's the next comment i'm gonna talk about but um <laughs> i i can't remember the last time i saw a journalist like actually physically cry, if we're, cry if we're talking about a whining yeah. crying yeah yeah that's one thing but uh i can't remember i cried but mm. Yeah, I guess, and that brings up a good point. There's a difference between what should be categorized, I think, as a journalism position and what is more of a personality position, though. Some of the, you know, I would say some of the big corporate cable outlets don't necessarily differentiate very well and, you know, try to kind of blur those lines and they and you'll see that kind of stuff happening. So maybe it's a matter of just being more clear, hey, you're watching a... You know, you're watching an editorial panel now of, I don't know, or maybe people should just be smart enough to spot that. But listen, I think going kind of hand in hand with that is is the one of the things I think ruined 
journalism for a lot of people is the po rise in popularity of TMZ. Now, I'm not blaming TMZ, TMZ. If the market demand, you got to roll with it. But there was so many, many times in the beginning of TMZ that TMZ would approach, they were celebrities or politicians or whatever, as journalists. And then they would hit them with the crazy uh, gotcha moment questions and everything else. And I think that has a lot in TMZ. I think that kind of goes hand in hand with we're at trust level and the approval level of journalism. Mm -hmm. James, do you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I think uh, um, I, I agree with Bill. Uh, uh, and um, well, Stop doing that. We're yeah, yeah, because yeah, the, le next, uh, the next oh, uh, comment is this um, is a good conversation. No hysterics. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. Um, I I think that uh, it's just you know being being controversial is is um, now and and I have to I have to kind of go back kids that have now grown up and they're they're being adults now uh, the way that they were brought up a lot different than we were brought up um, and and you know things that that were funny being being a bully or being picked on or are things that uh, a lot of these video youtubers uh, actually doing you know that that kind of mindset is is really um taken hold again in, in my opinion uh for the adults and the, so have to kind of try to, to offer them a different view to get it home a, a lot of times. Right. And I think that at the end of the day, it's the responsibility of the journalist to say, hey, maybe there is something that I don't know to be aware enough of what you might not know. And, you know, there are certain moments I remember specifically where I had somebody write me and say, hey, you know, you didn't include our voice and it wasn't because i i had been trying to be biased i just didn't even know that existed and so then i would just go do another story and share that but but sometimes it can just take a while to even understand these topics that's again why people ask all the time like why is the whole believes it leads thing and and these these quick um you know uh, uh sensational storylines why are they always at the top of the show and why do we just see more and more of that and it's not just because people do watch that stuff, but it's also because it's just easy to do. It's crime is easy to do. You, you just go knock on a couple houses. Can you tell me about your neighbor that had this thing happen to them? And you just get a quick sound bite and you put it together and you're done. It doesn't require tons of public records requests. Usually it doesn't require, um, you know, traveling to a bunch of different locations typically because the crime happened in this one specific location. So you just sit there all day with your fast food and the, you know, car and just edit and get heart disease. But, um, you know, it, it, there's a lot of just efficiency and, um, I mean, I don't know if I, you know, sometimes it's laziness, but more times than other, it's just, listen, this is what we can get done. I, I remember once when there was a cougar that swam from the mainland in Seattle, um, to an island Vashon Island, I believe, is where they're very, like, very hippie, pro-animal rights, kind of. And um, they were all thought it was very cool that they had a cougar on their island until the cougar started eating people's livestock. And then they were like, we need to kill mm -hmm. the cougar. And so they, and the, the state came in and did, um, I did, I believe, did euthanize it. And um, it's interesting because I wanted to go do that story. Like, well, wait a second, look what happens. You know, everybody loves animals, loves, lo loves predators until predators are in their backyard. And it was an interesting story for me, right? Because like oftentimes I was covering predators from a from the Seattle area where everybody's just like, leave them alone, leave them alone. And, and there was always this divide between the people who actually lived with the predators and the people in the city who never had to deal with predators and, and trying to balance those perspectives because they were both very important perspectives to hear. But the reality was to get to that island and go do that story was gonna be impossible with my deadline. So they ended up putting me on something. I remember it was about um, 
uh, we had a solar eclipse or something coming in and there was a company that was making new glasses so you could look at the eclipse. And they're like, just go do that instead. Cause I just, it was a one-stop shop. You know, that's, that's the phrase, a one-stop shop. You just go to the place, they show you how they're making the glasses. You talk to them about their new technology. Boom. Now you've got a four o'clock story that's easy to put together. So we never did the predator story, which was going to take a little bit of time, more time than we had. And we went and did the solar eclipse story. And, and oftentimes that's how decisions get made. Not, not because it's like, uh, you know, oh, well, it, you know, it's more politically advantageous uh, from our our perspective to do the solar eclipse story, and and that just pushes our bias. It, it was just because that that was what we could get done by four o'clock. That's part of the reason I got out of the business because I just got to the point where I was like, uh, I'm just not doing you know the work that I really want to be able to do. I stopped wanting to go after really complex stories, knowing that I was going to have the ability to to do them well. And um, I just started doing stories that were easy to get done, you know, that I felt like I wasn't going to let the viewer down at the end of the day with, I, I don't know, I don't, I, I don't know, I haven't had time to research this. And then I was like, well, what is the point of, of doing this? If I, you know, it wasn't like all the time, I've gotten to do some really good stuff towards the end of my career, but, but more times than I liked, I was doing, I was doing stuff that you could get done quickly, not stuff that I really felt like was important work. I, what, what do you think about that, Bill? I know you probably saw some of the same stuff. Uh, all the time. It's so hard to put together a good news story anymore. And just say, for example, Allison, that story you just told, I don't think that's a story minute 15 package, uh, not a, not in a good effective way that gives both sides of the story. So uh, yeah, it, the deadlines and I never had a problem with deadlines myself because i thrived on that i thrived on that pressure and boom 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 hustling getting stuff and uh, getting something done but you're 100 percent correct in trying to get that before something like that it really puts a strain on a lot of journalists especially one man bands who are having to do it all themselves right do you all remember oh go ahead sorry james yeah I, um i was gonna, going to to say he, he bill hit it right on the head there um that's the way that, that, you know, the one man band, the anchor uh, journalist has to go about doing the things. I mean, can you imagine having to do, um, to get the B-roll footage of the cougar out there on the island? I could just, just uh, imagine, but what a, magni a magnificent story that could have been. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I also think that kids, um, you know, talking about just getting it done quick. I mean, we they live in this, this you know, it's got to be done now. It's got to be done quick. You know, they've just been brought up and they don't take the time uh, to really discover something. They, they're they just in this such a fast-paced lifestyle, this 24-hour news cycle. And, and you know, uh, uh, three different things, you know, Facebook. And, and um, Twitter and nothing else. They're, they're all doing it. And they're, they're uh, what's that thing they do? They, they record their videos. Um, uh, the thirty-second <laughs> videos they do. You know, I I I, I see like it all TikTok the time. Like TikTok or I've never done the, it, but yeah, uh, like right. TikTok exactly. Yeah, <laughs> TikTok um, journalism. They just just yeah. that's just the way. It, and, and back when. I came up and was was trying to get into it, and, and I mean, we got our news, you know, newspaper back then. Or, or you know, you didn't see uh, when Walter Cronkite. I, I I play a clip from Walter, Walter Cronkite students, and they want to know who's that old guy with the mustache there. I'm like, you guys just don't understand. At one time, he was the most trusted individual on the planet. Mm -hmm. What he said was gold and that's that that's gone away you know that that just doesn't happen anymore so um i didn't yeah, need to I, get on a rant there <laughs> I, I think i think it's also important to also tease or people who want to get into the field the importance of using these mediums to back in the day and i know you two know exactly what i'm talking you would have have to drive the live truck and you'd have to send the mast up and you'd have to get, mm -hmm. get the signal tuned and locked in nowadays i'm live at a shooting this is all i need 
myself. Right. And there's no reason why you shouldn't be doing that to stay at least competitive in the market of journalism. Do you all remember days. something we were talking about? Because uh, as Busha Busha, I call BS if, quote, we are way beyond that, then you are supporting big boy institutional censorship. Does that make sense to you? I, I said, when I said we are way beyond that, I, I think we're way beyond, uh, what I was saying was that we're way beyond the point of worrying about the personal responsibility of what people consume, whether it's journalism, whether it's video games, whether it's movies, television, music, we're way beyond that because there's no such, I don't want to say there's no such thing of personal responsibility. We're way beyond that. Now, what that has to do with big boy institutional censorship. I, I think basically he's saying that if you don't take responsibility, then you're just putting, you're putting, <clears throat> the truth and information in the hands of these corporations and their their institutional censorship. I I just I will disagree. I think I think that we're still at an era where and perhaps even more than ever um people are both going to echo chambers and seeking them out because they're triggered by hearing something mm -hmm. that, you know, and I see it on my own channel when when people that I have on say something or I say something that um you know, people, I'm, I'm unsubbing because, you know, this one thing, you know, <laughs> okay. Um, but at the same time, I do see people more and more because of maybe, you know, just over the last few years, um, it, this, this conversation about s speech suppression has become more and more part of the public conversation. I think that it ha it's probably been happening for, for many, many decades in, in different forms right but but the public hasn't had the same ability to communicate with each other you know since in the last 10 years versus what it used to be like and so i think the idea of speech suppression and fake news and and propaganda and um disinformation campaigns and all that kind of stuff is is more something that the average person they may not know a ton about what it means but i think they know those words now and 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 i do think are starting to wake up actually more to their need to be at least skeptical. They may not go the next route and and um, okay, well, I'm skeptical I, and go f go from complaining about it to then actually trying to find a solution to it yourself. You know, do the research yourself and all that stuff. But I, I do think I hear more and more people, and I don't know. Again, maybe it's because of my corner of the internet um, talking about about it. Like I said, even if they're not seeking out the the information they're complaining about at least a little bit more skeptical. Now that said, there also is the other side of the coin, which is the people who are just like, I don't want to hear it at all. I'd rather just, I just want to hear. I do think that even for all the folks who are saying, I, I really am sick of media bias. I want objective journalism. Um, I do think some people who say that may not actually want that, that, that we're in an era where you can be told what you want to hear. And I do think that even people who say they don't want bias actually like if you were to really examine their internal consumer or their, their internal bias and the way they consume as reflected by of, of that, you might find that in fact, they don't really want, um, you know, balanced, uh, object, you know, objective, like if that's even possible, but they, they don't necessarily want that in the way they say, I, I, I don't know. Um, let, let's see if I can find a couple more, uh, is there anything else you guys want to talk about that I, I brought up before I bring up another question? I can't think of anything else. Th oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, Mr. Dinsmore. No, you're fine. I, I was going to say, I think uh, um, that, that the cancel culture is um, a huge, huge thing. You know, we're, we're, we talk about that in, in class, you know, um, people are afraid to say, you know, about a particular topic. If you're trying to find out information about something, people are afraid, um, like school, like I'm a, I'm a teacher, right? A big thing is getting back to school, I want, by getting back to the physical building and teaching. And there are some teachers that are dead set against it. And there are a lot of teachers that really would rather do it. The teachers that really want to do it won't say it. <laughs> They won't, they won't come out and, and say that, that they really want to be in school, um, but, you know, these other people are doing this. So um, I think that's really affected a lot of uh, the new 
attitudes that we we get now. People are just, you know, don't want to be, you know, um, put doxxed or something worse than that um, now. So kids have to, my kids um, have to take that in, into consideration. You know, there, there may be a time, a uh, place where somebody doesn't really want to say something and you have to respect that. You know, um, so. Yeah, no, I think that th those cents. are interesting points. Um, and it kind of, so a couple, um, a couple comments to that point. Postmodern eradication of objectivity leads to inevitable result that journalism becomes drama. I actually, the more research I do about the history of journalism, the less I'm convinced that this idea of objectivity has ever existed, that we are just like this first era of, of advocacy journalism. Um, because it just seems like it's been around for a long time. It's just the format's different and maybe the power the the amount of money wrapped up into it and the, and the concentration of power at the top related to it may, may have now made it more, um, effective at whatever the, the campaigns, the information campaigns are that these, you know, the people in control of the information want in so in, so, in a way that maybe, I don't know, I don't know, maybe, but then again, there were fewer options before. So, so perhaps you actually had more control back in the day than today. I don't, I don't know. It's, it's a good question for debate, but I just, I don't really, the more I read into it, the more I'm kind of like, you know, I don't know if we ever really had this idea that, uh, if anyone ever even, 200 years ago was like, oh, okay, we can trust the press. You know, it's, it seems like people didn't tr <laughs> trusted the press for a long time. And then someone else was talking about cancel culture and, um, I'm going to try to find it, but, uh, oh gosh, let's see if I can go all the way. It's basically about how cancel culture has affected, um, what we're able to, oh yeah, here we go. Cancel culture has accelerated faster than anyone ever expected. And I do think that cancel culture, if that's what we're going to call it, you know, the idea of a mob coming after you and your ideas and potentially getting you fired from your job, it probably is in the back of the mind of a lot of journalists in the same way that they are fanning the, without perhaps even necessarily being aware of the ego involved in it, but the, that that performance that we talked about earlier, the other side of the coin is that cancel culture side of it, right? So if you're not if you're not doing the popular thing, then the backlash is far worse than it could ever be. So you can have the same, you could have the, a bigger following than you ever could, and you could also have a bigger hangover than you ever could in the past. And And I do kind of think that journalists, even in editorial meetings, are sometimes afraid to bring up contrarian points to popular narratives because they're just afraid their peers are gonna think they're all kinds of ists you know they're racist they're sexist they're what whatever you know things are now thrown at people for for saying well what about you know this this side of the coin um so it's not just that but then what if then the manager say okay if they can even see that perspective all right let's let the person do that that story and then the the mobs come after them you know and so and i do think that that real time uh, mobocracy is what I call it. I do think that affects journalists. Not, not sure what you guys think about that, but. This whole concept of cancel culture is the selective way it is applied. I'm going to give you a prime example. There is a certain daytime talk show, which I'm not going to name here, that has a certain member of the panel who, because that person doesn't deserve my breath, <laughs> Either way, no, this person had such a with cancel culture when Kevin Hart couldn't host the Emmys. Now, this person is calling it consequence culture. Well, two years ago, when Kevin Hart was Emmys, it wasn't cancel culture, or it, it wasn't consequence culture for his controversial tweets about homosexuality. But now that it applies to somebody that's fitting your narrative, you know, just. Well, no, that's a like really. You, dude interesting point to make which is and that's often times when we talk about censorship that's exactly what i bring up which is we have certain ideas about well of course no you 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 know free speech has to be allowed for these people that say things i'm comfortable with but don't realize that when we start pointing fingers at well that's dangerous information 
because it's not something that we're comfortable with. And, and hell, maybe it is, you know, there is crazy stuff that people are saying. I, mean, I would never deny there isn't crazy stuff happening on the internet, right? That would be dumb. But, mm -hmm. but who gets to make that decision? And the fact that people can't see that they have these, these, these desires to give the benefit of the doubt to the person that they align with versus wanting to bring down the hammer harder on the person they disagree with. The fact that people can just see how, how, how we are all susceptible to that every single one of us. So who's going to be the, the judge of what is consequence culture versus cancel culture or what is dangerous information versus what is just a, an important, mm -hmm. like a whistleblower, you know, <laughs> who, who, who decides that as if, mm -hmm. as if, as if any of us yeah. lives in this world where we don't, I mean, all of us, have in-group bias. All of us have the ability to be susceptible to wanting to believe people that are in our group versus the people that are outside of our group. And to think that, that, you know, that that's not something we're susceptible to, like you just brought up, I think is really naive. And it, it, it is becoming dangerous in the way that our government's pushing for um, speech suppression. You know, the, the big three, the top three, uh, Google, Twitter and Facebook guys are all going to be back in front of Congress uh, soon for another hearing on this. And, and, and there's more legislation proposed to, to um, make section 230 uh, uh, even less um, open to, you know, free speech. So to, to sort of, to, to, to affect what would be considered harmful information and stuff. So, so it's going to heat up in the next year. And it's just, it's again, just to go back to my original point. It's, it's, it is, so shocking to me that 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 even journalists think that somehow this couldn't go this couldn't go sour you know that it couldn't end up the power couldn't end up in the wrong hands and then all of a sudden now we've lost our ability to to have uh, uh information important information and access to important information that challenges the power structure and also this is one comment i don't think walter cronkite well, yeah. is from woodchuck i don't think walter cronkite was unbiased people trusted him more because they didn't have the information to challenge the narrative today that information is easily obtained that's one other idea I mean, you can't sit there and say really anybody was completely unbiased i think almost everybody in some point in their life is biased in some way towards something and i don't mean that in the important ways I'm talking about, you know, I'm by the rival of the Kentucky Wildcats. I mean, that's what I'm speaking more of. There are biases in everyday life. That's what it is. But I think Cronkite was trusted for a reason. And I think he earned that trust from a lot of people. Mess says there's a reason the printing press yes, wasn't free to use. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm curious, uh, James, when it comes to your students and their desire to the ones who want to do this professionally, what, what is their reason for why they want to get into the field? Um, <laughs> uh... <laughs> <laughs> um, is it because they want to be on television <laughs> oh god it, that hasn't changed that hasn't changed uh, you know i, Jay, I Jay, think I'm, I'm, some... I'm gonna i'm gonna kind of preface this a little bit because and if this makes me the bad guy that's fine there are some attractive people who have been told that all you got to do in journalism is stand in front of the camera look pretty and they give you money there's some of those that do exist James, I'll let you take the rest, but I'll be the bad guy on that one. I don't care. Um, I'm sure that that uh, that goes into um, a lot of it. They're they're thinking some people. Um, I'm trying to think of the kids that I have, you know, that are out there working now, um, and most of them actually they they love of the process of getting the information and, and doing the research and, and um, sharing the story. Telling the story is, again, is, is the most important thing. Um, and some people just, just have a knack for doing it. Um, I don't have, and I have quite a few that are, uh, but none of them are, are, are what I would consider like, you know, beauty queens and um 
you know, macho men or anything like that, even though there are a few that are, that are, that are, you know, nice looking and, and stuff, but they all, they all have worked hard to get to where they are and to do what they, they do. So at least That's I would hope that. I, I would, yeah, I, I would have to agree. There are some that are very hardworking and want to be the best can be, but I think it's also naive to say that those ones that I described don't exist either. But I think that's a big reason why some, a very select few of them get involved. I think some of them, Allison, like you said, get involved because they want to be on TV. But that I could shift to where now they, they don't necessarily have to do that. You know, any kid with a right. phone can uh, be a and YouTube if you go star. work in TV, so, right. guess what? You're not just putting on your makeup and doing your hair. You're running the camera yeah. and edit it. And so I remember mm -hmm. one of the interns that worked with me in Knoxville, she she was like, I'm out of here. I'm going to go work mm -hmm. in PR. I don't want to do this. Because she couldn't believe, like, there, there was the third time she forgot to bring her lunch. Because I warned her, we don't have time to stop for lunch. So you need to bring your lunch. And I'm serious when I say right. we're not going to stop for lunch. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry to be a, you know what about it, but it's going to get to the point where we don't have time and we are not stopping. And I'm not kidding. And the third time she didn't bring it. And I was on breaking yeah. news and I was like, sorry. She's like, but I'm starving. And I'm like, I can't help you. I told you to bring your lunch, you know? And she's like, I'm done with this. You know, she's like, how much do you make? <laughs> Told her, you know, my first job, I made $18,500 before taxes. Um, and, you know, I had to have help with wow. my apartment because I couldn't afford it. And so um, when my parents helped me out paying for my rent, and I, I never could have done that without them, honestly. I, I, well, I, know, I know people that were on food stamps, their first job. So, and now you don't even just push through that to then get some cushy job where now you're doing one story every other day with a photojournalist who's driving the car and you're just doing your makeup, you know, opening up the little mirror in the front and, oh yeah, and talking on the phone. No, you're doing it all. So, so yeah, there, you could find far more glamour being an influencer on social media, if that's mm -hmm. what you want to do, than being in TV news for sure. Cause it's a grind these days, especially if you want to be a good journalist. I would love to get y'all's opinion on something that's kind of a hot button topic right now and how it applies to journalism or even young people getting into journalism. If the $15 an hour minimum wage does pass and becomes national law, how is this going to affect the way that new station hire people? Because I'm sure you two both know that a lot of these stations like say Missoula, Montana, or Lima, Ohio, they hire these poor kids at, you know, to term a, uh, to coin a Bernie Sanders quote, slave wages, paying a minimum wage or $8 an hour, 18000 a year at bed or on food stamps or something like that. But I'm also going to say understand why TV stations try to do that because not every Every TV station is a money-making venture. Some of them lose or they have to be supplemented by other stations in their corporation that do make money. So how would the $15 minimum wage affect stations and journalism jobs in that way? Well, I mean, I know that if the salaries met cost of living in some of these markets, it would be more feasible for more journalists who don't come from like the background I have, I've talked about. I came from a very... Um, privileged background. My parents helped me with my internships and helped me with my apartment in my first job. And so could I have done that? Yeah, but I, I on my own, but I probably would have come out with a lot more debt. And mm -hmm. if I was somebody who was thinking about, well, I could go take my skills into public relations and not have debt, <laughs> you know, versus yeah. doing the internships in television or then starting in a job where I can't afford to live. I don't, I just don't know if I would have, I would have chosen that career. And I do think it would open it up to people who don't have, have the, you know, the, the same financial ability to, to just, you know, well, I, like, you know, especially if you already have debt from college, you know, so you've gone into debt from college and now what you're going to take a job that give, you know, 18, five, there was a guy, a reporter, I remember he had a, a video almost go viral talking about this, like how in debt he was. And so, yeah. And you know what? 
back to um, that one comment regarding how to have journalists be more exposed to different cultural, you know, socioeconomic worlds and cultural worlds. Um, that that's part of the problem too. I think is that it, it's a you know a, a career that oftentimes it's, it 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 has you know people with a, a certain socio cultural background can af can afford to get into and and people who don't like you know for instance one of the the first like why well, I, I rode horses growing up so i met a lot of people through that like the, the agricultural community and stuff rural communities and i think that that made a big difference for me but it was covering the environment that really got me into different cultural worlds because a lot of the new you know the 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 further you work your way up you're living in bigger and bigger cities. And so Bill, back to your point about the salaries, you know, you have to make more money in order to pay your bills in these, these big cities. Some people have second jobs. You're like, what's your ability to get out of your bubble if you've got to work on the side in order to keep your journalism job? I mean, you're not going out necessarily and, and you know, you're stuck in your metro area and being an environmental reporter was what forced me out into rural areas a lot more often. And I remember being on a panel with a woman who had a, a podcast for the local public radio station who also moved to the middle of nowhere, also has an Airstream that she, they renovated and they're living in. It was very weird, but she and I both kind of came to the same conclusion. She's like, because we both ended up moving to these areas that we were covering more. Like we, we liked living outside of the city because we were spending a lot of time out there. We were just, we, we liked being in peace and quiet and we didn't want to come back to the city. And she said, it's so obvious now how we're missing huge swaths of this country um, because of just the, the way that, you know, we're not, we're not, um, connecting and not influenced by the ideas outside of these little Metro bubbles. And, and I, and, and I don't know, like, I, I, I don't know if, if once you get to the Seattle level, you know, it's as much of a, uh, of an issue, like with the question you're talking about specifically with a $15 minimum wage, but in a, a little market like that, like Macon, Georgia, where I first started, I think that would have opened it up to a, a wide variety, a much wider variety of people to start with. And then, you know, maybe that gives you different ideas in the editorial meetings that then make things different when you do move your way up into these bigger metropolitan areas. I, I'm not totally sure, but I think at the lower, like the smaller market, it probably would make a difference. Yeah, I'd have to agree. Uh, I'm interested. I, I would be interested to see um, the long-term effect of how that's going to happen. Because, uh, like, like Bill was, you know, those sw small mar markets that have to pay the bills uh, on the building, the rent on the building, or, or you know, the electricity bill. Um, how how are they going to sustain that? I, I really, if they have to pay the the fifteen dollars an hour i mean does that mean that my tech director is going to have to be the floor director <laughs> you know, too i mean how 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 is that going to i mean uh, I, i'm just and my, you can't i mean you know like like cameramen and doing you know they, they've done away with camera operators and, and put in one person mm -hmm. with a joystick um but you know who can afford that hundred thousand dollar system you know, if you're if you're having to to uh, pay that, so it's yeah. If you're if you're a TV station in Jackson, Tennessee, right now, which there's only two, it's a very very tiny market in between the Memphis and Nashville markets. And I would go so far as to venture to say Jackson will probably become uh, part of the Nashville market really soon when the uh, DMAs come out, probably in about two or three years. Now. But Jackson, the property taxes in Tennessee are through the roof right now. And a lot of that is for varying different reasons. We're not going to go into that here. But Tennessee property taxes have tripled over the last decade. And they have, we, they have nothing but one-man bands, no photographers. The uh, editor of the morning show is also running the audio board for the morning show. And, you know, they're paying. And this poor guy, eight dollars, eight fifty an hour. Now I got to pay him fifteen bucks an hour. It, it's it's going to be interesting to see if that dynamic ever comes into play and how the smaller market stations to handle it, how the corporations are going to handle it, and the influence on 
the de the decisions that young people will be making going into uh, colleges. You know, do I want to be a journalist? Or yeah, not? and I do remember my first to go back to like whether the affordability of it and whatnot. I do remember it's not like we had this fancy newsroom and I was just the one getting the short. <laughs> Our live truck was growing <laughs> weeds in the parking lot because nobody was re fixing it. You know. We, but that could just be because we were ter we had a terrible operation and nobody watched us. So our ratings sucked, and the other stations made more money because we just we just were just uh, nobody. We didn't have good managers. It wasn't even necessarily you know what I mean. It wasn't necessarily just the that oh it just takes a lot of money to run a newsroom. And so it was just like we had we put out pretty terrible news, and um, <laughs> you know, and and that's why our live truck wasn't working. I used to work at. And I don't care. I mean, I'm not trying to throw anybody under the bus, but WTVQ in Lexington, Kentucky. I worked there for two years. The worst run business I've ever worked at in my life. Not the worst run TV station, the worst run business. And <laughs> this was when the light bulb went off to, I got to get out of here. <laughs> I, went in, I went in one night, or I went in one day, and we lost internet service. Okay? We he didn't have cable or internet. And it was because, and we found out later because their vendor in six months. Oh my goodness. They finally shut off that service. Well, fast forward to that weekend, our weekend overnight photographer called in sick. I said, Hey, I'll cover shift. I came in and I'm not lying. The lights were out and I'm thinking to myself, they just, you know, couldn't pay their, uh, you know, internet and cable bill, they've shut this place down and didn't tell us. I've got personal stuff in my locker I want to get out. I've, I fully expected chains to be on the doors. It happened is a couple of miles up the road, a car a drunk driver had ran into a pattern and, and knocked out power for about a good three square miles. And <laughs> but the bad thing is, I said, oh, okay, woo, we didn't lose power, or, we, you know, we, we're not shut down. I'm morning show producer said, well, no, it's still terrible because our backup generator hasn't kicked on because we couldn't afford oh the maintenance. God. Yeah. It <laughs> that, yeah. If that doesn't tell you the state of uh, finances when it comes to local journalism in a top 60 market like bad. Lexington, Kentucky, that's, um, that's pretty Somebody bad. did ask about uh, Mussolini being a journalist, so I just did a quick Google oh, search. Yeah, and. Uh, this is Wikipedia, so take it for what it will. Uh, you will. Uh, it says that Il Popolo d'Italia, the people of Italy, was an Italian Bless newspaper you. which published editions every day with the exception for Mondays founded by Benito Mussolini in 1914 after a split from the Italian Socialist Party. The paper was founded as a pro-war newspaper during World War One. So there you have it. Anyway... Well, so there, so like I said, I guess it just brings us back to the original point was, is this the first, you know, era we've ever seen of, you know, <laughs> untrusted journalism that's been pushing certain agendas? I don't think so. Anyway, closing thoughts, guys, before we go, I know you guys are in later time zones and dinner time and whatnot. Any, any closing thoughts for people that they should know about today's modern, modern journalism world? Go ahead, Mr. Densmore. Okay, um, I was going to say, you know, maybe that um, it's always kind of I've been there, but it, it there are two things um, as prevalent um, as it as it is now, um, and people are not afraid to to do it now. You know, I think before um, not B would not show uh, their bias. Whereas now they don't care. Um, and now, you know, with again, the 24 hour news cycle and everybody's access to the internet, um, it's, you can find it. If you want to see it and you want to be there, you, you could certainly find it. Um, I, that's something I just, I, I have to tell, you know, my kids um, that again, it's about the choices you make and, and it's about character. You know, it's, it's a, uh, I was reading, there's a really cool thing that I, I got sent uh, about Steve Jobs' last days. He wrote down some things, and, and one of the things was there's a big difference between being human and human being. You know, there's you, it, it, when, the, when it all was over with, and 
you need to treat others with that respect um, while telling that story and and just be, be be good you know it's like that old say like we as teachers you know you learn everything that you need to, to to know in life in the second grade and by the second grade if you would just keep that forward if you keep keep going forward with that so that's kind of the made out there bill closing thoughts I, I love that sentiment and trying to uh, instill uh, integrity and character in young journalists. Uh, my final thought is, is if you're a young person and you're, you're watching this and you're thinking about get, getting into journalism, I will be the first person to tell you don't. <laughs> don't. It, it, it's not worth it. Bill, it's clarify that. What do you mean? Do you mean corporate traditional legacy journalism or do you mean just being a journalist like at all going out on your own what clarify what you mean by that i would say not at all <laughs> either or because no, i'm <laughs> what are we gonna do if there aren't any I, I journalists like actual real like, functioning journalists in in 60 years same with farmers they're all dying out too yeah and you know depending on who you talk to the best way to start is with no journalists and i'm not i'm not saying i agree with that but the stress it puts on young people here is you know you're already 60,000 80,000 100,000 in debt to go get a job that you're going to be making 20,000 a year i see stories about it so many times where young journalists will go and take a job thousands of miles away from their hometown where they have no support system just to get that opportunity. And then they are just crapped on and used and abused like a rented mule, like Vince McMahon does wrestlers. But you're and still talking I mean, about the corporate so model. You're not be, talking about like, if you wanted to start a YouTube channel and just start filing public records requests and FOIAs, and you want to be a 22 year old who's, mm -hmm. you know, driving to like I, those guys that I've had, Brendan Gutenschwager is a great example. He's a young kid who just with Twitter and his cell phone has been covering some of the unrest over the country. And his video has been all over the country and he's just direct to consumer and he loves it. He loves flying around the country and putting himself in harm's way. And he doesn't, he doesn't deal with any of that stuff you're talking about because he just bypassed the corporate model altogether. And I'm not disagreeing with that. I would go to the independent journalist like uh, BG on, on the scene and Andy knows and all them. No, he got the crap beat out of him and may have brain damage for the rest of his, his life. Tim Poole, you know, whether you like Tim Poole or not, he was attacked just covering the Wall Street um, protests. Occupy. Uh, whatever that was called. I can't remember. Yeah, Occupy Wall Street. You know, and if you don't have the backing of a corporate place, because Allison, you and I have talked about this before, being put into dangerous and hostile situations, but you've also got to have, yeah. you know, our well, like health care. I had health care well, in case you, I could beat afford... the crap out of so I could go to the hospital. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, exactly. So, and... and on top of you know not having that kind of protection, you got to deal with the. If you think Jim McCoy or any of these other people actually read their responses to their tweets, you're out of your mind. They don't care. They probably have somebody back at CNN headquarters in Atlanta tweeting for them. Okay, but the independent journalists, I love the execution because in a lot of ways for your mental health and. For your physical well-being it's just not safe don't do it <laughs> um so matt somebody brought up matt taibbi i i do i do consume i, I support him on Substack, and i've really enjoyed hearing his take on stuff so he i think he's a good example of course glenn greenwald left his own outlet and now now he's independent um so so more and more people are doing it but there has been criticism brought up like everyone's now in order to get journalists uh, reports now we're all going to have to be spending like $300 a month on, you know, these paywalls and whatnot. Um, but I don't know Then maybe you just cancel your cable bill and you, you put the money towards that. Uh, well, my last thought is that I, I disagree about, I, I don't tell ever tell people don't or do something because I'm not God and I don't know what, what your journey is. But I, I do think that it's really important that no matter what field you're going into, but since we're talking journalism specifically, that that you come at it with a, a healthy mindset about what it is that you want to do and 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 how you're going to do it 
and and regularly be self self aware and self critical on whether that means like I said earlier in our live stream spending time in silence uh, decompressing cutting the cord with your your mobile devices just go to therapy you know I don't know <laughs> like talk to people who are different sign up for a club of people that are di very different from you um don't don't if you're somebody who's regularly unfriending people on social media you're probably not a good fit for the field. I, I, I will say that if you're somebody who's regularly freaking out and highly reactive to the world around you and you're unfriending constantly and uh, you, you like the idea of censorship and cancel culture, I think I, we would probably prefer um, that you not necessarily <laughs> go into journalism. The three of us, I don't know. I'm speaking for myself. So I just say, I, I would prefer that at least maybe you just go talk to somebody before you get into the field about it. And you know what? This is coming from somebody who, used to think that she wanted to be an addiction psychologist. When I left my my first cable news job, when I was working at Fox News Channel, I quit to go to graduate school so that I could be an addiction therapist. And that was because I had a family member who was dealing with a very severe addiction to heroin. And I, I remember telling, you know, professors that I wanted to help other people because I couldn't help my family member. And one of my very astute professors was like, that's not a good reason to become a therapist because you're just going to be working all your issues out onto your clients. You need to deal with your issues with your family member and then consider whether you really want to be an addiction therapist. And you know what? After two years of therapy, I was like, screw this. I'm terrible at this. I, you know, I get, I'm totally codependent. These people use me and abuse me. I was working at a methadone cl uh, clinic and they were, the clients were just, patients were easily able to like lie me into giving them, you know, oh, I've, I, you know, my, the sob stories, like, I'm so sorry, you know, I, I you know, what, because I was still, you know, dealing with my own issues. And so it's the same thing. Like I had to admit that, you know what, maybe I'm not, this isn't the best field for me for these variety of reasons. But also once I dealt with some of my own internal issues, like I went back into journalism and I was, I was better for it because I had, I had danced with my demons and I had figured out, um, uh, how to let go. And, and I know it seems dumb. Like it almost seems a little bit too woo woo for a conversation about journalism. But again, I, that's what I tell people all the time, no matter what field you're going into, but specifically a field where you are literally looking at reality and in, in a, in a, in a way interpreting it for people, you're, you're, you're taking what you're seeing and you're, you're channeling it to the public, like telling them what you saw. So if you're not seeing clearly, if you're seeing through foggy glasses or smog, you know, mental smog, then what you're giving people is going to be a funhouse mirror version of what's going on. And so there's, to me, there's no way to really uh, um, adjust that or fix that. No corporate model that's going to change that. It's the journalist's own self-reflection and own work of their own heart. Truly, I believe that, that, will make that difference. And so if you're going to go into it, that's my advice. Do that, you know, really, really be serious about being, knowing yourself, knowing yourself and knowing, knowing what baggage you carry and how to let it go. Guys, thank you so much for this live stream. I hope everybody learned a lot. Um, I'll see you guys on Monday. I, I uh, have a lot in store for this next week, which I'm excited about. Um, anything else guys before we go? Thank you so Thank much you so for much. Having us. Okay. Yeah. Bye everyone.